Welcome. We're going to start into thinking about Colossians in this session. And it's going to be a, an introduction to Colossians, if you will. We'll cut over here to our graphics and you'll see that we are preaching through Colossians. But today we talk about introduction. And when we think about the word introduction, usually that just means I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's coming up. And, and that's somewhat true even in biblical studies. But Really, in biblical studies, the, the word introduction is used sort of in a technical way to describe a specific part of studying a book of the New Testament or the Old Testament in biblical studies. So this is what introduction is all about. And these are the issues that usually anytime you find an introduction to a book of the Bible, these are the th kinds of things that are going to come up, maybe a, one or two extras or maybe one or two less. But this is what's going to be discussed. So we can look at them. the authorship. So who wrote this, right? That's an important question as we're thinking about how we understand any book of the Bible. We want to know who wrote it. We might want to think about when it was written, because that'll help us understand the book as we begin to study it. If we know what was going on in the culture at that time, knowing that date will help us understand what the writer is writing about. Then we need to think about who the book was written to. Okay, and sometimes that's said right in the book. We know, and many of the New Testament letters say Paul too, and we have the the city to which he's writing, the church which is going to receive this letter. So that's important. Then we'll see the purpose. Why was this gospel, this letter in the Old Testament, this prophet? Why did they write? What was the reason for the writing? And if we identify the purpose, sometimes we can see the overarching themes. And rather than just getting stuck in what's going on in a few verses, understand the whole sweep of the book. And we're definitely going to do that as we walk through Colossians. Then theology. Now, theology may be a word that you're really comfortable with. Maybe you go, I'm not sure exactly what theology is all about. But really, we're talking about doctrine here. So what is the author trying to teach us about what we should believe. And as we walk through Colossians, we will definitely see a theology at work in Paul's writing. He's definitely teaching the Colossians some important things, especially about who Jesus is. We're going to get to all that as we go along. So we're going to think today about some of these introductory issues um, and the very things that we just talked about. But let's first think a little bit about the city of Colossae. Now, in the fourth and fifth centuries, BC. So before Jesus, what we find is that Colossae was an important city. It's in what we would now call Turkey, what they then called Asia. And I want to show you a few maps that I think will help us get to understanding where Colossae was. So let's look at that. This is a map of Paul's, what we call his third missionary journey, right? Paul goes on three journeys that are called missionary journeys in the book of Acts. You can read all about that. And then he has that final journey to Rome where he is under arrest. He's probably going to face trial. He's in prison, basically. But this is the third journey. And as you can see, Paul begins in Antioch in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean. This is Paul's base of operations. It's a cosmopolitan city. It's a city that is very diverse. We see that at work in the New Testament. It has a strong church and it is a sending church. So they sent Paul on these journeys. And then he travels by land through Asia. That's part of what we would call Galatia, all the way to Ephesus. Now you'll notice the city of Colossae on this map right there in the middle. But what we also notice is if this red line traces Paul's third missionary journey, what we see is that Paul doesn't stop there. Well, why would Paul write to this church and not stop in Colossae? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that, but it seems that Colossae is not a place that Paul has visited when he wrote the letter. And then he goes to Ephesus, where Paul spends three years, basically, with uh, the Ephesians. A very difficult time for him, may have even been in prison during that time. And then he circles back up toward Macedonia down into Greece, then traces back up, and then by sea goes across the Aegean, so from Greece to Turkey, and then travels south, goes in at Miletus, where he meets the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and then heads back to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem will go to Rome. So here we see Paul's journey, his third journey, and he goes right by Colossae. Now, 
if we go on a little bit further, get a map that focuses in a little bit more. And this is that same area. So off to the west, you see Ephesus, and then you come back to the east. And let me take my picture off there so you can see a little bit better. Down at the bottom uh, south uh, east corner, you see three cities that are closely related. Uh, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Those are sort of sister cities. And they run along, you see right there, right beside Colossae, just north of it, the Lycus River. So this area where those three cities are, are, uh, are located is the Lycus Valley because of the Lycus Valley, the Lycus River running through it. Now, the main road goes right from there to Ephesus. Paul did not travel that road because he didn't go to Colossae, but many people did. So that's one of the reasons that Colossae has some value. Let's go to one more map. Oh, here we go. This focuses in a little bit more. Again, you see the Lycus River. You see Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis. Okay. So those are the cities that uh, surround Colossae, and we're going to talk specifically about Colossae. Now, let me get myself back up here. And we'll talk a little bit more. <clears throat> As I said, we do know that Colossae was an important city in the Lycus Valley by the first century. Colossae, however, has been surpassed by Hierapolis as an important city in the Lycus Valley. We'll need some more uh, information in just a minute. And by the year 60 to 61 AD, so this is after Jesus, right? Jesus is about 30 AD is when we see the crucifixion. By 60 to 61 AD, we see that there's been a major earthquake in Colossae and it destroys part of the city and there's a major decline in the city of Colossae after this. As I said, we have no record of Paul visiting the church in Colossae and it's from it's clear from the letter itself that Paul has not visited at the time of his writing. So Paul is writing to a group of people most of whom he has never met. Okay? And what we find is that during Paul's time in Ephesus, a native of Colossae, a man named Epaphras he comes from Colossae to Ephesus, hears Paul preach and teach, and from there becomes a Christian, takes the message back to his hometown of Colossae, and he converts people. A church is founded because of Epaphras. So if Paul is first generation, Epaphras is second generation, the church in Colossae is third generation. At some point, Epaphras travels back to see Paul, though we're not sure where Paul and Epaphras meet. We'll talk about that. A little bit later, but while they're together, Epaphras reports back on what's happened in Colossae, which prompts Paul's letter. So we have Epaphras coming from Colossae to Paul, becoming a Christian, going back home, then coming back to Paul and saying, here's what's going on. And then Paul writes the letter to deal with some of the things that were happening in Colossae. Now, we want to think about who wrote this letter. And you think, well, isn't it obvious that Paul wrote the letter of Colossians? His name is right at the top. And that's true. In fact, we need to look at that. Here's the thing. Not everyone believes that. And we're going to think about why, but we're also going to think about what points to the fact that Paul really did write the book of Colossians. Now, remember, in introductory studies, we're always going to think about authorship, who wrote this. And so we want to examine this carefully as much so we're aware of the issues so we can understand them and if people have questions about them. So this is what we read in Colossians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So who's the writer? We'll say, well, Paul is, and Paul is a writer. I mean, he says that right at the beginning. This is the way ancient letters worked, right? We say, in at least American culture, uh, Dear James, I want to let you know about this, that, and the other, and then we sign our name, okay? But in the ancient world, the name of the author was first, so Paul would put his name at the very top of the letter, then the people he's writing to. And that makes sense here in Colossians. And we see similar thing over at the end of the letter, the very last verse. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. What's Paul talking about? Well, probably he had a scribe. 
what might have been called an amanuensis, and we will think more about that later, that listened to Paul, wrote down what he was saying, and then Paul sort of signed it at the end. So verse 18 is in Paul's actual handwriting. Okay, that would have been the part that they would have seen in his handwriting. The rest was in someone else's hand. Now, the book itself claims to be from Paul. Okay, it says so right there at the beginning of the letter and at the end of the letter. So why might some people say, well, I'm not sure. Let's look at the issues today. Let me switch back over. Here we go. Here are some reasons that people challenge Pauline authorship. And we say, who is Pauline? Well, this just means of Paul. Okay, so if we can talk about Pauline authorship, we can talk, talk about Pauline theology. That means it just has to do with Paul. So first thing that we deal with here is the vocabulary that's used there. And what was that matter? Well, what we find is that there are 34 words that appear in just the, the four short chapters of Colossians that appear nowhere else in the New Testament. Now, here's a technical word for you. Hapax legomena. Okay, everybody say it with me. Hapax legomena. Now you can impress someone when you take that word home. And what that means is that word appears only once in the New Testament. We're talking about the Greek text of the New Testament. And there are 34 words that appear only in the book of Colossians. And some people want to say, well, it doesn't make sense to say Paul wrote this when he uses different kinds of words than he uses anywhere else. 25 words appear nowhere else in Paul's other writings. So that's a bunch of words. However, we have to admit, if we really look carefully, that much of the syntax, the, the words that are used, are very similar to Paul's other letters. Okay, so that's one issue. Plus people will say the vocabulary of Colossians is different from other letters, so I'm not sure Paul wrote it. We might also look at style. Okay, style. A style of writing. This is more about feel. Okay, how does the letter feel? Does it feel like the same kind of person wrote it as maybe wrote Romans or Galatians or either one of the letters to Corinth? And some people say it feels like a different style. In Colossians, we find a household code. And what that is, is just Paul saying, this is how you relate to one another at home. Fathers, treat your kids this way. Wives, love your husbands. Children, obey your parents. It was very common in the ancient world for uh, a work to have a household code. But Paul has only one other household code, and we find that in the book of Ephesians. So people will say, well, this is not like the way Paul usually writes. And what we find, I think, is that really it is very similar. Here's another issue that we have to deal with. Theology. Now, again, we talked a little bit about what theology means. This is just what do we believe, right? Okay, theology is what do we believe about Jesus, about sin, about ourselves. Those are all theological issues. And, and we need to think, okay, does the theology of Colossians fit other Paul Pauline works? And we can think through that. Some would say Paul talks about authority different. Authority is a theological issue. Paul says, I have authority over this church because I'm an apostle. And we can continue to talk about another really important issue in the book of Colossians, and that's Christology. Now, that may be a word that you've not run across before, and that's okay. Christology means our theology, so what we believe, what we understand to be true, our theology of Jesus. Who is Jesus, and how do we understand Jesus? Christology is hugely important because how we understand Jesus reflects our whole faith, right? If, if Jesus is the Son of God, then he deserves everything we've got. If he's not the Son of God, then we have a whole new way of thinking. Paul is very clear on who Jesus is. So Christology is the study of Jesus. Colossians espouses or teaches what has been called a very high Christology. And what do we mean by that? Jesus in, in Colossians is given an exalted place, okay, a high and lifted up place. Paul, in the, message, in, the, in the message of Colossians, Paul really understands the nature of Jesus in terms of what we see in verses 15 to 20 of chapter 1. And I want to read that for you, and we'll again come back to this, but listen to what Paul has to say about Jesus. No one is like Jesus for Paul. This is what he says. The Son, that's Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So he's the image of God, okay? The firstborn over all creation. 
For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So creation itself is ultimately all about Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, top. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The very nature of God dwells in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now we're going to look at that much more carefully when we come to that passage. But my point is, Paul gives Jesus a very high place in Colossians. If some have said, this almost sounds like the kind of thinking that comes much later, even in the second century. But I don't believe just because we have a high Christology means that Paul could not have written this. I believe Paul's Christology leads to how we understand Jesus. And we see that at work in some of his other letters as well. Paul's dealing with this false teaching, and he wants to make the Colossians see, we'll get to this, that there is nothing they need beyond Jesus. And so that's why he helps them see just who Jesus is. Some would say what we see of Paul's ecclesiology is different from elsewhere. Now, what's ecclesiology? Ecclesiology is the study of the church, the ecclesia, the assembly in Greek, okay? So when we think about ecclesiology, we're saying, how do we understand what the church is? What is the place of the church, okay? Is the church something that operates on the local level? Is there just one church and that's it, you know, universal church? These are the kinds of things that we talk about when we think about ecclesiology. And just as Jesus is this cosmic figure in the book of Colossians, the church in many ways is seen as a heavenly gathering of the disciples of Jesus. It's local, but the church is clearly seen in an exalted way. So Paul has a high view of the church. The church is important. It matters. Okay. And it's a developed hierarchy of offices than what we see in Romans and Galatians. Again, that doesn't mean that Paul didn't write it. And that's what some people will, will say, and I think that's in error. And we also get to eschatology. Maybe you've talked about eschatology, maybe not. This too comes from a Greek word, the eschaton, but it just means last things, right? How do we understand how all things are going to be brought together in the end? Whereas in other letters, maybe First Thessalonians in particular, Paul points forward to the return of Jesus forward to the return of the resurrection of the dead. Paul's emphasis in Colossians is slightly different. Now, I'm not saying he contradicts. I'm not saying he's saying a different thing. His emphasis is different. Now, some have argued that Paul teaches what is called a realized eschatology in the book of Colossians. Now, that sounds really complicated. All it means is he's saying Jesus has already done what Jesus is going to do, and he's finished. We don't have to look forward to him returning. We don't have to look forward to judgment. It's already done. But I think if we do a careful reading of Colossians, what we'll find is that is not true. We see Paul looking forward in at least chapter 3, verses 4, 6, 24, and then chapters 1, verses 22 and 28. So I do not believe that we see an, a realized eschatology in Colossians, what I think we see is Paul saying Jesus has already been at work in a powerful way, but Jesus is also going to be at work in a powerful way in the future. So I don't think that's very far from what Paul teaches in other places. And then we see Paul teaching about justification. Justification is how God makes us righteous. And it doesn't take any of us very long looking at ourselves to recognize that we are not righteous, that we mess stuff up but that we are made righteous only in Jesus. Now, Paul talks a lot about that in some of his other letters, less about that in Colossians. So some say, well, Paul's not even talking about his favorite subject. Maybe he didn't write this. On the other hand, I think Paul is writing about different issues here. Now, what you will find is that in 30 years of preaching, I have preached a lot of sermons about a lot of different things. And if somebody looked down at my preaching and said, oh, well, James talks about a lot, a lot about us being made in the image of God, which is true. It's in Genesis chapter 1, carries all the way through the Bible. That's an important theme in my preaching. But then you might see a whole series that doesn't talk about that. 
And someone might say, well, maybe James didn't write this because it doesn't mention the image of God. Well, I don't talk about the same things all the time. So to say just because one thing doesn't mention it means somehow it's not mine is inaccurate. And I think it's an inaccurate way of talking about Paul as well. Now, let's come back here. Let's think about first century letters for a minute. Now, when someone says, I'm not sure that Paul wrote Colossians, they are not saying it doesn't matter. They're not saying it's not valid, that it's not binding on us. What they're saying is that sometimes in the ancient world, people would take the teaching of someone else, put it together in some writing, maybe in letter form, and say, this is the work of this person. For instance, Paul. Maybe Paul had some people who listened to him, heard him, it recorded what he said, and then they're addressing something specific. So they take this, the store of Paul's teaching and write it up and say, this is, this is what Paul said. Well, it is what Paul said, but Paul didn't write that specific thing down. So they, some scholars believe that's what happens here, that people who followed Paul had access to his preaching and teaching then later on wrote this all up in response to something that happened after Paul. I think what we see is that if we really study the book of Colossians, we find, yes, Paul talks about some different things, but that it's basically consistent with what else we see. As Scott McKnight, a great New Testament scholar, wrote a really fine commentary on the book of Colossians notes. Here's what he says, that the argument against Paulian authorship is based on the assumption that Romans and Galatians are automatically Pauline, along with 1 Corinthians and Philippians. And everything else has to be judged based on that. So if it's different from what we see in Romans, not contradictory, just different themes, then maybe Paul didn't write it. However, I think that's an erroneous approach, and so does McKnight. McKnight argues that this is from Paul. Now, remember, Paul has co-workers. If we go back to chapter 1, we read this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Who's the author? Paul and Timothy. Now, might it be that if Paul wrote one letter by himself and Timothy was present for the writing of another letter, that second letter might be somewhat different? Well, of course, because Timothy is present. And sometimes we say Paul's letter to Col the Colossians. Well, it is Paul's letter to the Colossians. But more accurately, we should probably say Paul and Timothy's letter to the Colossians. Some of what is said here is certainly reflective of what Timothy is thinking, and he's with Paul. We also know, as I said before, that Paul probably had a scribe or an amanuensis, someone who listened to Paul and wrote it down. You would hire someone to do that. Okay, In the ancient world, very common. I want to write a letter. I want to make sure it's done correctly. My grammar, my spelling may not be perfect. I want it to look professional. So I hire someone to write it. That seems to be what Paul's doing, because as we read at the very last verse, remember chapter 4, verse 18, Paul says, I write this part in my own hand. So I'm signing off to you know, so you'll know it's actually me. So there are people that are alongside Paul that would have influences over what was written down here. Now, we have to remember that we have nothing in Paul's handwriting, right? And we have copies of copies of copies of what Paul actually wrote. But again, I think when we read through this letter, what we find that just because it's a little different, the emphases are different, the style may be slightly different, even some of the words are a little bit different, that doesn't mean, well, automatically it can't be written by Paul. Well, we know sometimes Paul used words and phrases from his opponents, so he's quoting them because they're the problem, and he says this is how we deal with this issue that they've brought up. So that would at times introduce new words. We also know that there are times when Paul quotes hymns that may be present. We may see that in Philippians chapter 2, and we may see that in Colossians chapter 1. So Paul's bringing in something that was familiar to his readers and using it in his letter, which introduces language that may be from somewhere other than Paul. Remember that the New Testament letters were often written to specific churches dealing with specific issues, okay? 
So that means that they're not all about the same thing, even if they're from the same author. And furthermore, through the emphasis in Colossians may differ from other letters, the theology of Colossians really is consistent with Paul's writing elsewhere. So on the whole, for me, it makes the most sense to say Paul himself wrote Colossians. Now, again, he's probably got a scribe. He's probably got Timothy helping him with this. But Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Colossae that he had never met. Okay. Now, that's an important introductory issue. That's all about authorship. I want us now to think about when this letter was written. So, the date. When does this actually get written down, put on paper, and sent off to Colossae? Colossians belongs to a group of letters that have traditionally been called the prison epistles, okay? Now, which ones are the prison epistles? And they're all sort of a similar size and probably came maybe at a similar time. That's often what's assumed. It includes Ephesians. It includes Colossians. It includes Philippians. And then it also includes Philemon. Now, Philemon is closely related to Colossians. And we'll see that they were probably sent together from Paul, Epaphras, by Tychicus, and then read at Colossae to both the church and then to Philemon himself. The traditional view, and let me get rid of a picture of me there so you can actually see. The traditional view is that this was written from Rome, so Paul would be imprisoned in Rome, all four letters written 62 to 63, and that may be. Uh, Paul was under arrest. This is the description that we read in Acts. Paul's journey to Rome is that he's imprisoned, he's under arrest. However, scholars have noted that a number of people that Paul has with him as he writes to Colossians are from the Lycus Valley. Remember, we talked about that in the beginning of this lecture. Places like Colossae, Hierapolis, Laodicea. They include people that he mentions, Tychicus, Onesimus, and Epaphras. We're going to become familiar with those people as we go along. Now, so if Paul has people from the Lycus Valley with him, it makes it less likely that he's in Rome, 1,200 miles away. Now, 1,200 miles is a long way if you're driving. It is a very long way if you're walking or if you're going by sea when you don't have an engine to power you. You're just going by rowing or you're going by wind, okay? Now, there's a hypothesis that deals with some of this, that Paul is not in Rome. He is in prison, that's clear, but he's not in Rome. Rather, we could look at what we might call a, an Ephesian hypothesis, that this letter was written from Ephesus. Now, we talked about his, Paul being in Ephesus on his third missionary journey. That would be in the mid-50s. We know that he was there three years. We know that is a very difficult ministry, and we know that there's all kinds of problems in Ephesus. Paul gets some attention that he doesn't really want. And what we find is that it could be that Paul was imprisoned even as he was in Ephesus. Now, again, we're not 100% sure about whether this was the imprisonment that we're talking about, but what we do know is that he could have been imprisoned in Ephesus, and that's why we would find people nearby, like Onesimus, like Tychicus, like Epaphras, with him in Ephesus. Much easier to get from Colossae to the close-by next big city, Ephesus, than from Colossae, 1,200 miles to Rome. So, maybe Paul's imprisoned in Ephesus He's got this extended time that's not mentioned. Remember, Luke doesn't tell us everything that happened in Paul's ministry. So he may have had imprisonments that we don't know about. We also know that Paul planned to go from Rome to Spain. It doesn't make sense that we see some of the language that we see at work here that he would tell these Christians he's soon going to visit if he's going the other way. So if that's all the case, Paul probably wrote from Ephesus in the mid-50s or even as late as 57 rather than during his Roman imprisonment. Okay, so the date, my guess is, is in the midst of the 50s. Now, the next thing we have to understand is, what's Paul writing about? And, and what I mean by that is, when Paul writes, he's usually addressing a problem. Paul usually doesn't write just to say, man, y'all are doing great. 
Okay. I'm so proud of what you've done. Now he may say that, but then he goes, but there's this other issue that we need to think about. And it seems that there are some opponents that Paul is dealing with in Colossae. Maybe they're not opponents of his, but Paul sees them as opponents of the true gospel. Now, as scholars look at this, people who've studied it a lot more than I have, they've not reached consensus on the identity, or even maybe if there are opponents of Paul's in Colossae. He doesn't identify any one specific opposition, but he does counter some false teaching or some tendencies to false doctrine in chapter two. A big chunk of chapter two is devoted to this, and we'll study that in more detail later on. Now, some argue that Paul doesn't write to counter any organized opposition, but rather tendencies to adopt the beliefs of Greek, Jewish, local religions in some syncretistic form. Now, what does that mean? Syncretism is when I take a little bit of a lot of different religions. Say I like a little Christianity. I like a little ancestor worship. I like a little worship of these gods over here that are Greek gods or traditional gods or whoever they may. I, I like all that and I'm going to bring it together and to keep everybody happy, I'm going to keep different parts of that at work in my life. Paul may have been dealing with some of that. And he's pointing people and saying, you don't need that. What you need is Jesus. And over and over again, what we come back to in Paul is that Jesus is enough, especially Paul in Colossians, that Jesus is really all you need. Others argue that Paul writes uh, to counter some Judaizing forces. In other words, people who say you got to become a Jew before you can become a Christian, a little bit like what we read in Galatians or in Philippians. What makes the most sense to me is this, is that Paul is writing against a group of people who have these kinds of tendencies. Let me get this up so you can see it in more detail. So people who have Jewish ideas and practice, in other words, you got to obey the Sabbath. Okay. And that was, a, you know, 10 commandments. The Jews believe you got to keep the Sabbath day. You rest on the Sabbath day. You don't work on the Sabbath day. And there are all kinds of food laws that we see at work as well in Jewish thinking. And it may be that some Christians are beginning to bring that over. In other words, let's make sure we're pleasing God. Let's obey the Sabbath laws and the food laws. Well, Paul has a problem with that because he believes Jesus has changed all this. It may also be that we see some mystical religions at work. So in other words, this group says we have special knowledge, right? We have special practices that will lead you to God. And it might even be a little bit secret. Okay. But you need to listen to us. And what's Paul's answer to that? No, you need Jesus. Syncretism. We talked about already a combination of various religions. Asceticism. What's asceticism? To be an ascetic is to mean that you deny yourself something. You might even abuse yourself in some way in the name of religion. Okay. You don't eat. You, you deny yourself water even for a time. All these things so you could become more holy. And again, Paul's going to say, you don't need that. What you need most of all is Jesus. Exclusivism. We're going to exclude people because we're special because we believe visions are necessary. And if God sends you a vision, then that means you're a real Christian. But if you don't get that, then maybe something's wrong with you. So Paul's probably dealing with a combination of these. These things have shown up and Paul wants to say, hey, listen, you don't need special practice. You don't need to go back to Jewish practice. You don't need mystical religions. You shouldn't combine all these religions. It's not about denying yourself in order to follow Jesus. There are times we have to say no to ourselves, but that doesn't just automatically get us closer to God to deny ourselves food or water or anything else. And visions are not what we need. What we need is Jesus. That's Paul's message that I want us to hear over and over again, is that what we need above anything else is Jesus. Now, we also need to deal with just briefly the relationship between Colossians and Philemon. If you read through the book of Philemon, what you see is some very similar names. You see that Philemon was written to a man named Philemon. Well, who was Philemon? He was a Christian in the church in Colossae. And he had a runaway sweat slave. And we're going to spend a couple sessions because these books are so closely related. Later on in our time together, we're going to look at the book of Colossians. Very short. What's happened is 
Philemon is the owner of slaves, and he has a runaway slave named Onesimus, which just simply meant useful. A lot of slaves got that name because their masters wanted them to be useful. So I said useless. It's useful. So Onesimus is Philemon's slave. He runs away from Philemon. It seems that he has taken something that belongs to Philemon. So he's a slave and he's a thief. He runs into Paul. Now, again, this is sort of why we make the case that Paul is in Ephesus, not in Rome. It takes a lot of money, a lot of effort to get from Colossae 1,200 miles to Rome. He could get from Colossae to Ephesus. That makes much more sense. So somehow Onesimus has come in contact with Paul, wherever he is. And what we know is that Onesimus has become a Christian. But Paul knows this. He is always going to have trouble. He's always going to have a problem as a runaway slave. People are going to be looking for him. And what he needs to do is to go back to Philemon. So Paul writes this letter that we call Philemon, and he hands it to Tychicus along with the book that we call Colossians. And he says, I want you to take these two letters back to the church in Colossae, and I want you to read them. And what he says in the book of Philemon is, hey, Philemon, take Onesimus back. Okay? Take him back, not as a slave, but as a brother. Okay? He's useful, and he's become useful to me, Paul says. Useful in the way that a Christian brother is, not as a slave. So he calls on Philemon basically to forgive Onesimus for what he's done. So Tychicus carries both of these letters back to Colossae. And from there on out, you see what happens. So we'll talk through the details of lots of that. But what I want us to see most of all, above everything else that we've talked about, I know that's a lot of information about uh, the introduction, or that technical word of authorship, date, opponents, all those things we've talked about. The most important thing for us to get from this opening is that Paul is dealing with some false teaching of some kind. We don't know exactly what. We can only read what he's written. And that's sort of like listening to a one-sided conversation. Like if someone's on the phone and you can't hear what the other person is saying, but you can hear what this person in front of you is saying. You have to sort of figure out the conversation, even though you're only hearing half of it. That's what we've got in the book of Colossians. We've got what Paul says, but not what the other people say. So we have to figure out the whole conversation just by what Paul has said here. Now, what Paul says that's most important is that Jesus brings us to completion. Jesus gives us everything we need. That's the overarching theme that I want us to take all the way through our study of Colossians. And we'll think about that, how that relates to our preaching and teaching as well. But this is something that we need to learn, not just as preachers and teachers, but we need to learn this as followers of Jesus. So when I want to bring in something else that I think is going to be the answer to my spiritual spiritual problems, if I want to listen to what someone else says, what I really need to do is to think about Jesus. Because ultimately, Jesus is what I need. Jesus is what I need in this life. Jesus is what I need for eternity. Jesus will always be sufficient because of what we read in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20, that Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the head of the church. Creation is for Jesus. And if all of creation is for Jesus, guess what that means about me? I was created for Jesus. My life is all about serving Jesus. And so is yours. So we're going to come back to that. And I hope this has at least uh, helped you see what's going on. In review, I mean, what we're saying is, yeah, I believe Paul actually wrote this down. And some of the arguments that are given for someone else writing have some merit. But overall, what we see is this being consistent with what Paul says elsewhere and that the presence of Timothy and scribes and quoting other stuff that that he uses in his letter, other writings, really do help us see that this is Paul writing to the church in Colossae and that he's dealing with some false teaching that's taking them away from trusting Jesus completely. And we're going to take that theme and we are going to run with it throughout Colossians and run with it in our preaching and teaching 
that this is all about Jesus. I'll see you next time.